I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Annika Culver, who is an uh -oh. associate professor of East Asian history at Florida State University, where she specializes in modern Japan and Northeast Asia related topics. She also teaches one of the nation's only courses on North Korean history. She received her doctorate from the University of Chicago and a master's degree from Harvard University. I think she's one of the most qualified speakers we've ever had for a theme semester event at Missouri Southern. Since 2012, Dr. Culver has served as a scholar in the U.S.-Japan Network for the Future, which connects academics to the foreign policy community. She has written numerous books and research articles on the Japanese Empire. Dr. Culver regularly gives media and television interviews on East Asian topics, most notably for The Voice of America, The New York Times, and Al Jazeera. She regularly presents at national and international venues. She is proficient in Japanese, Mandarin Chinese, French, and German, but she will be giving today's presentation in English. This is the second of three Zoom presentations she is giving as part of our Japan semester. On Friday, September the 24th, she will be speaking on the otaku culture, consuming, collecting, and comics in Japan from the 1980s to the present. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Annika Culver. Thank you so much, Dr. Sevens, for that wonderful introduction. I'm very excited to be here today, and I noticed there are about 35 participants who are also online with us, along with um, the seminar room that I'm, I'm seeing. Um, this is really great. Um, I'm very excited to share some of my research. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today comes from Chapter 4 of my book, Democratizing Luxury, Name Brands, Advertising, and Consumption in Modern Japan, which is going to be coming out uh, by University of Hawaii Press perhaps sometime later next year. Um, you can see some of the images here on the first slide. And they show really a commercialization of war, which many of you may be very surprised by. But during World War II, which in Japan began much, much earlier than for Europe or even the United States, there was a way for companies and department stores to advertise their wares amidst a climate of increasing frugality and um, utilizing images of soldiers, images of wartime comfort by purving small items for the military. And this is a way that these businesses could maintain their viability during a time of straightened circumstances. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more in detail about this phenomenon, but I just really wanted to quickly turn your attention to these images. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen uh, is where the namesake of this lecture comes from. And we see a little cartoon soldier there, and he is saying literally, thank you, Mr. Soldier, on the right. It's written down um, vertically in Japanese characters, and below him, a package of Morinaga caramels. Some of you may maybe have tried Morinaga caramels because you can actually get them in the United States in your Asian grocery store. And these were super popular amongst kids both in Japan then and even now. Um, and so these items of candy were actually per put into troop care packages or imonbukuro or these comfort bags that you can see to the right. And literally they're, they're a kind of canvas bag in which you would put items for the military. I think nowadays we put items in shoe boxes that we're going to send over to the troops. I know this was a big practice that literally began um, fairly soon after 9-11. I remember that, that was 20 years ago, some of you may have not have even been born back then, but I remember it quite vividly. And um, this was one of the ways that we thought we could contribute 
was sending over care packages. But during World War II, for which for the Japanese began as early as 1931 with the Manchurian invasion, which is Northeast China, 1931 to 1945. This was considered World War II for the Japanese. They know it as the Asia Pacific War. Um, what the Americans consider World War II, 1941 to 1945, um, this is called the Pacific War. Uh, for the, the Japanese. Down below, we see a kimono. And this has a lot of scenes of battle and children. And so this would be would have been a boy's kimono. It would have been much, much darker. The colors are, are faded. It would have been a deep purple rather than the lavender that you see right there. But you can see how even on people's dress, they they showed these scenes celebrating warfare. Um, and you can tell that it's war in China. The Second Sino-Japanese War took place in 1937 to 1945. And so you can see the battle scenes, which to young boys would have been very, very exciting. They could partake in the comfort of domestic Japan. They could partake the thrills of the battlefield um, just by, by wearing these items. Uh, Jacqueline Atkins calls this wearing propaganda. So literally they're walking propaganda with just by the clothes that they are wearing. It's called informal propaganda. It's not the real government-sponsored propaganda, but these were all efforts that the Japanese people felt they could use to support the war. Um, Jacqueline Atkins is also very interesting as she's a, a curator, um, and there was an exhibition a few years back called Wearing Propaganda by the name of, of uh, that same uh, piece that I was mentioning written by her, um, where these kimonos were displayed, and um, I was really quite surprised and amazed when I, I saw these um, these colorful uh, examples of how seriously people got into the war, at, which at the time they were pretty much just experiencing vicariously, but as the late 30s dragged on, more and more men would be drafted into uh, the increasingly harsh conflict with with China. Um, but um, let me show you some aspects of the commercialization of um, some of the war. Um, right here, we have an advertisement for both the Kingu magazine. Kingu magazine, or King, was a popular magazine in Japan at the time, all about actors and actresses, popular culture, what was going on. Um, and then you can also see here uh, the imperial military performance for, brought on for the Imperial Japanese Army. And down here is an ad for um, literally MSG and that you could put MSG in a care package. So um, let me give you kind of a very broad overview of why people were doing this and why would people actually put MSG in a package for the troops. Actually, a hint, the, um, the soldiers, when they were purveyed for going on their missions, uh, they often received only rice and they would have to um, requisition food elsewhere, i.e. take it from the conquered peoples that they in encountered. Uh, but the MSG, they could put that on top of their rice or other side dishes that they had had cooked um, or procured, um, and it would give them more of an appetite, especially during the heat of summer. Uh, but let me give you a, a broader context for some of these advertisements, which look like very celebratory of, of war. Um, commercial and state interests intersected during wartime, though burgeoning conflicts with China, then Southeast Asia, and finally the U.S., made corporations modify messages and even product quality. They initially welcomed hostilities with China, since this generated increased consumption and little affected domestic populations. Sake companies, including Gekikan, published advertisements showing marching soldiers shadowing bottles, and cosmetic companies like Kao and Shiseido vied for lucrative procurement contracts supplying Japan's troops or rationing civilians with soap, toothpaste, and pharmaceuticals. However, enthusiasm dampened after 1938 with rationing and government initiation of strictures in the following years. 
In 1938, Miyazaki Takashi, who edited Advertising World, a magazine highlighting industry trends, likely created the slogan, Luxury is the Enemy. Ostensibly, the government initially encouraged frugality over radically curtailing consumption while spurring war bond spending. However, between mid-1937 and early 1938, consumption reached fever pitch, centering on the military and victories on the continent, though shoppers reduced luxury item spending. Uh, Benjamin Uchiyama's recent book, Carnival War, really talks about this kind of thrilling consumption of war through the media, through newspapers like um, the Mainichi Shinbu that you see there. This is um, actually one of the um, Mainichi um, derivations that are in the Japanese Empire, actually centered in Manchuria. So it's called the Manchu Nichi Nichi Shimbun. So it's um, literally the daily news, but instead of the one published in Tokyo, this is the one published in um, Manchukuo, which was under Japanese control at this particular time. And it just kind of highlights the, um, the frenzies surrounding war where literally you have these guns um, that are, are pointing to this phrase on an advertisement. Business has also supported wartime jingoism in various ways. In late 1937, they encouraged consumers to purchase items for troop care packages or imon bukuro, literally comfort bag, in a practice time home front families to the battlefield's troops. The origins of this practice date from the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905, popularized by women's education proponent, Yajima Kajiko. However, the phenomenon's commercialization and advertising campaigns only accelerated after the late 1930s outbreak of war in China. In department stores, housewives purchased in-house gift boxes or imon seto, literally comfort item sets for the military, in patriotic gestures, supporting husbands, relatives, and neighbors who were sent by the military to the China front, though few packages reached their intended recipients. Care packages from Natsuzakaya department stores, Nagoya branch, cost one to two yen. Um, this is quite a lot of money because this could be about the salary of one working class laborer. And these included canned goods, which might be mandarin oranges and syrup and sweet red beans. These are still items you can buy in Japanese grocery stores. Uh, toilet tissues, fans, and candy. Consumers also purchased comfort postcards called imon e hagaki additionally serving as comfort items or imon pin, featuring representative Tokyo or Kyoto scenes inspiring homeland nostalgia. Visual imagery and words paired with these small items replicated the feeling of home for troops amidst the frontline squalor. According to a September 1937 questionnaire in the confectioner's trade magazine, Candy Making Experiments, the top items sold in department store comfort sets from Mitsukoshi department store in Nih Tokyo's Nihonbashi area, Matsuzaka in the Ueno area of Tokyo, and Isetan in the Shinjuku area of Tokyo were crystallized sugar and canned hard candy drops. So soldiers really appreciated candy's quick sugar high for extra energy, and in propaganda materials like postcards and newspaper stories, they also offered it to Chinese children for civilian pacification efforts. Amidst wartime hardships, shoppers might curtail frivolous items like candy or flavor enhancers, but purchasing for the military made consumption honorable for both home front consumers and the battlefield recipients. Thus, in newspaper advertisements throughout Imperial Japan, department stores and manufacturers staunchly advertised items desired by troops, a practice that continued into the early 1940s. However, in the late 1930s, images and products referencing the military proliferated and evoked a seductive power. Such advertisements also appeared in Japanese newspapers throughout the empire, including in Manchukuo. 
In the uh, August 7th, 1938 Manchurian Daily News, uh, Aji Nomoto, which manufactured the popular flavor enhancer monosodium glutamate, featured anti-aircraft guns exhorting in print. Think about the fierce heat of the battlefield. Fine text urged purchase for care packages. So, quote, resolute warriors could maintain summertime appetite to sustain their nutritional intake and fighting ability. Consumers thus engaged in public acts of patriotism through this form of altruistic purchasing. The advertisement ran below a half a half page spread in a large size summer edition of King, a high circulation Tokyo based magazine published by the press Kodansha, which billed itself as solace during a critical time that customers could also send to the troops. This advertisement seemingly targets married middle class women worrying about their men folk at war in sweltering weather who wish to augment combat effectiveness and morale. Um, the Japanese housewife at this time had a lot of power in that she controlled the household budget. So she was the one making the economic decisions and running the household. And uh, so such ads were very, very important in terms of their target audience. Um, also, according to anthropologist Carter Zina Tswirtka, quote, the armed forces enjoyed extreme popularity amongst the population. In the eyes of commoners, only the military seemed aware of the kind of problems that people faced in their daily lives, unquote. Behind the rising support for the military, Japanese subjects still felt uneasy. And again, I'm calling them subjects because they were um, controlled by an emperor who was commander in chief of the armed forces, but he was also the head of political authority. At the same time, the Great Depression raged globally, rural blight and depopulation plagued the countryside, and politicians and corporations increasingly appeared corrupt. Not surprisingly, advertisers responded with images of virtuous, weapon laden soldiers wrecking imperial chastisement upon continental neighbors in lean times. Even prior to conflict in China, consumers avidly read reports of Japanese troops and continental events, particularly on Manchuria or in Manchuguo. Historian Louise Young notes that from 1931, Manchurian-themed products abounded in popular culture, including in restaurant menus and even candy varieties. My own research shows how Japanese cultural producers use Manchuria's media appeal to promote their art sales or even heighten their own literary fame. The China War further focused Japanese attention towards Manchuria. Printed materials portrayed it as a peaceful developmental utopia under Japanese tutelage and a counterpoint to Chinese terminal. Um, Manchuria is Northeast China, which was in the control of the Japanese at this time from 1931 to 1945. In 1932, it was turned into Manchukuo, which was this putatively independent new state, but it was really under Japanese control with the Kanto army also being a Japanese military force. From the late 1930s, companies like Shiseido, which you can still buy their cosmetics, known for their modernist depictions of beauty products and promotional materials, also responded with martial imagery evoking Manchuria, the China incident, or soldiers, while militarism permeated publicity materials. Magazines and newspapers as print media played major roles in disseminating news and government propaganda messages. But war-related advertisements and articles also furthered the commercial endeavors of Japanese companies, hoping to maintain sustainable consumption levels. Advertising circle and government propaganda connections were ample, with advertisers enthusiastically promoting products with a nationalistic tenor. The Tokyo-based Asahi Shinbun, one of Japan's largest newspapers, 
boasted broad citywide circulation in outlying regions and Japan's empire. Once surpassing 1 million in circulation in the 1930s, today it remains Japan's top news publication behind the Yomiuri Shinbun. In September 1940, during the intensification of conflict in China, the Cabinet Information Bureau, which is in charge of propaganda at the time in Japan, issued an order to merge the Tokyo and Osaka newspaper branches. This government-controlled consolidation also limited paper use and print production, increasingly apparent in this next lean five years. Slowly cannibalized by wartime needs, reduction of newspaper and advertisement became clearly evident by late 1941. Um, some of the ads that I'm going to show you, because they're so spectacular and, and quite surprising, um, generally are from late 1937, during the time of the um, attack on the Republican capital of Nanjing, otherwise known as Nanking, and you may have heard of the rape of Nanking, which indeed um, was uh, what the Japanese military had done to the Chinese capital, um, engaging in just a brutal, brutal uh, attack on um, on the city. But of course, it's portrayed in the media as a great Japanese victory. Um, however, as the war bogs down in China, and then the Japanese involve themselves in a war with the Americans with the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, the ads begin to get smaller and smaller and smaller um, to the point where in the uh, mid-40s, 1944 to 1945, they're almost non-existent. And then you have ads for like life insurance, <laughs> obviously, because so many people are, are dying in the air raids and, and, and also the, the soldiers are, are perishing uh, abroad. Um, but the reason why I'm showing you some of these images from this leading newspaper in Japan um, is uh, because it can give you a glimpse into home front wartime life. Uh, its large circulation and everyday domestic presence helped ordinary Japanese feel connected to domestic and battlefield events while experiencing simultaneous consumption patterns and consciousness of trends and fashions through advertisements. In recent years, journalists and scholars have examined its wartime role in reflective pieces and edited volumes on the media organization's responsibility for war. Journalist and independent scholar Frank Gibney has also compiled translated letters to the Asahi Shinbun editor, showing how Japanese citizens expressed their wartime experiences. However, advertisements uniquely serve as barometers of Japan's wartime climate, while also evoking official government propaganda aims. So some of these images that you're going to see will show Asahi Shinbun advertisements during the crucial Nanking campaign against the Republican Chinese capital, a period that is curiously overlooked by media scholars or cultural historians, and you probably haven't had a chance to see either. The tone, size, and frequency of advertisements for non-essential consumer goods changed as the war intensified. These small luxuries including included Western-style cosmetics, like those produced by Shiseido, or wine, candies, and patent medicines. From mid-summer 1937 to late 1938, since the war's outbreak, Readers vicariously enjoy descriptions of troop movements deeper into northern and eastern China with the fronts ever widening. Surrounded by similarly militaristic advertisements, special sections highlight the Imperial Army depicted as conquering heroes engaging in gentlemanly conduct in tough, honorable battles over less advanced foes. Unsurprisingly, patriotic evocations of nationalism product advertisements peaked in the Nanking campaign's beginning and end. On the 2nd of November, 1937, when Japanese troops trudged towards China's capital, a third page Gekikan Sake advertisement touts, long live the Imperial Army. So you can see that here um, on this advertisement. Above two, um, Hinomaru, which is this flag, the um, rising sun flag, along with uh, the raid flag, uh, flying atop a bottle towering over Nanking's signature walled gate with a similar Japanese flag aloft. 
To the right of the product's larger name, here's Gekikan. Smaller print notes, absolutely no preservatives. Anticipating alcoholic celebrations of Nanking's surrender, Gekikan's ad hails a looming triumphant military victory, inviting consumers to vicariously enjoy this impending victory. Two days later, Ajinomoto's half-page advertisement shows a bayonet flying a Japanese flag captioned above with long live the fortuitous victory of the Imperial Army's righteous ideals. To deadly effect, soldiers imposed these on Nanking's Chinese. The ad ominously foreshadowed the massacre's perpetrating weapon. Further boosting the product's nationalistic appeal, fine print reveals the Imperial Household Agency's endorsement, implying that even the emperor enjoyed the seasoning um, monosodium glutamate. Um, on the 7th of November, advertisements for the Takarazuka Review also enthusiastically endorsed War's progress, with songs lauding the Axis alliance between Japan, Germany, and Italy, and promoting a show featuring bomber squadrons attacking Nanking. A ribbon in wraps notes framing the image, domesticating a sonorous wartime brutality. Um, to kind of give you some context, um, this actress here is performing a male role, and she is dressed as a naval captain. And um, the Takarazuka Review was originally developed in the early 20th century by a railroad entrepreneur of the Hankyu Line in Osaka. And so he wanted to get more um, people to take his particular railroad line. And so he built this Takarazaka review um, in a kind of um, suburb of Osaka. So you have to travel to it. And you can see these young women, they perform both male and female roles. And it's a musical. It's just absolutely fabulous. I went and visited Takarazuka and I saw one of their shows in 2017. It's just absolutely blows your mind because it's even more extravagant than anything you see in Las Vegas. Um, they just have the most remarkable scenery, um, remarkable songs, huge cast of hundreds and hundreds of performers. Um, and it's, it's just a great big spectacle. But you can see here how um, you know, the, the Axis Alliance and all their flags, the, the German um, flag with the Nazi swastika on it, the Japanese flag and the fascist Italy, Italian flag are all there. Um, so um, perhaps we might react with horror now to see in this particular present context, but uh, back then um, it was a celebration of this alliance with these different powerful Western countries. Build a great Imperial Army victory. Nanking's mid-December defeat generated numerous congratulatory advertisements. On the 11th of December in 1937, a full-page advertisement for Lion Toothpaste featured a large map of eastern China's Yangtze River region, showing Japanese flags waving towards Nanjing. So um, you can see here's the mouth of the Yangtze. They're traveling up this river. Each major city has a Japanese flag here. And um, they're following the railroad lines. And um, you can see how they're making their progress towards Nanjing right here. Uh, this says lion toothpaste, um, and this is Kogun Banzai, or long live the Imperial Japanese Army. Um, this is obviously the military, and they are the Navy. Um, and then um, basically this says here health protects the, the country. Uh, so... Below this uh, interesting map, there is a grinning sailor and soldier who happily gaze into four lanterns festooned with long live the imperial military. Between them looms the phrase, the field which transmits our country's might. To the right, another phrase asserts that health protects the country. Finer print urges consumers to thank the imperial military and explains toothpaste's patriotic health-promoting effects, supposedly leading the Japanese troops to victory. 
Lanterns evoke celebratory Tokyo parades, also appearing in other advertisements communicating a jaunty patriotic atmosphere. The toothpaste ad evoking grinning white victorious smiles of Japan's military firmly inscribes a brutal wartime expansionism where Japanese flags populate China's landscape. The news even spawned department store sales, coinciding with further military victories. Starting on the 12th of December in 1937, huge half-page department store advertisements like for Matsuzakaya's Ueno branch celebrated Nanking's fall in congratulatory sales. It remained open until 9 p.m., and consumers could clip the ad to redeem a free item. In addition, large shops hosted sales for an array of comfort items for Imperial Army soldiers and officers to thank them for their accomplishments. In making such purchases, wartime shoppers engage in consumption as, as a patriotic endeavor over the profligate waste of scarce resources at a critical time. The Asahi Shimbun Company also developed war-themed postcards showing the Japanese Imperial troops joyful receipt of comfort bags. And so you can see some of the, um, the troops receiving their bags here. And um, such cleverly manipulated scenes assured home from customers of appreciative consumption of their purchases by battlefield troops. Sent throughout domestic Japan, Manchukuo, and the empire, postcards ostensibly reinforced Japanese subjects' morale and served as material agents of informal propaganda produced by publishers and advertisers. The postcards here is entitled uh, the military care package is loaded with your sincerity. And it's labeled a postcard to confront, comfort the Imperial troops. It was created by the, um, the, the artist uh, Sato Namiko for Shonen Club or Youth Club magazine. Um, which was um, for adolescent boys at the time, and it depicts two sisters preparing a comfort bag while one knits a winter sweater. It hints that warm hearts and sincerity are essentials, but assumes addition of further goods to combat winter's harsh effects. Department stores furnish such comfort items with Isetan advertising woolen socks, earmuffs, and underwear for troops in December of 1937. With such imagery, advertisers, department stores, and postcard publishers collaborated to manipulate the desires of families, relatives, and friends to connect, stay connected with the men at the front. Thus, department store advertisements and other media urged consumers to engage in sacrificial purchases of small items for loved ones at war, helping soldiers to feel supported by their families and thus increase their morale and fighting capacity. This is what the consumers believed. In military care packages, soldiers especially sought sweets like morinaga caramels and canned hard candies, along with writing paper and small notebooks handmade by schoolgirls. According to Aaron Moore's studies of soldiers' diaries, troops in China lamented food shortages, but sweets were preferred during battlefield deprivations. The writer Ishikawa Tatsuzo embedded as a journalist within a Nanking campaign army squadron, revealed in his 1938 novel, Soldiers Alive, how troops sought sweets while complaining how few care packages actually reached the front lines. Many of these desires were no doubt reinforced by the era's commercial imagery. Um, so here we have another ad for um, Morinaga Carmel, um, and it shows here a comfort bag right up here floating rightwards of the candy's large printed name. So Morinaga Milk Caramel. So Morinaga Milk Caramels. They're made out with, with milk and sugar. And um, smaller print, which really targets pre-adolescent boys, um, it patriotically says, at the newsreels, you are stimulated by the battle's victories. Let's send a messenger of comfort to the soldiers in a burst of battle. <laughs> so um, this is the translation for the for the the phrase here, and um, this is interesting. Uh, yushi it literally means like heroes. 
right? So like heroic soldiers. Um, and um, so young boys, of course, were targeted by ads like this. And only three days later, another candy advertisement attracted younger schoolboys with the uniformed cartoon soldier saluting readers. Left of the childlike script indicating, let's thank Mr. Soldier. Finer print above him, up, up here, uh, indicates, let's give caramels to the soldiers in a care package to increase their spirit. Um, the word for spirit that they use is, is genki. So in Japan, if you go there, um, little kids will always ask you, uh, genki desu ka? Or o genki desu ka? Um, means like, how are you doing today? But um, are you in good spirits, literally? Um, and so we can see here that special department store sales thus targeted children to buy small items for soldiers they knew. Though care packages really rarely re reach specific persons, women and young children felt that they could contribute to overseas war efforts. Is a popular means to maintain home front support on the battlefield, the package joined the Senin Bari, or the Thousand People Stitches Belt, or the Hachimaki, or the Helmet Wrap Headband. And um, at least for this time period that I covered, um, advertisements during Japan's key military campaigns surrounding the attack on Nanking evidence national imaginations about how the public wished to view their troops, carefully manipulated to prompt consumption during an anxious time for companies who produced non-essential comestibles. Soon repurposed as comfort items for the troops, these products were advertised in depictions that hauntingly reflect the intersection of military and commercial interests during a burgeoning war in China that rapidly became a quagmire, with the Nanking campaign now remembered as one of modern warfare's most infamous wartime atrocities. However, the frenzied commercialism surrounding Imperial Japan's supposed victory has largely remained unstudied. Um, so I'm gonna show you a few images of these comfort bags and just show you how this, this worked. Um, here we have the outside of the comfort bag. Um, and these are the different tags that indicate where it's coming from, um, how much it weighs, the time when it's being sent. So these are like postal tags. And you can see what it looks like. Um, there's a, a drawstring for the bag that would be tied shut. Um, and then um, this is actually from um, a Japanese auction site. So I wanted to actually buy this and it's essentially on Mercari, which is like Japanese eBay. Um, unfortunately, I was too late when I made my bid and I couldn't couldn't buy it because it's literally an unused comfort bag from way back when um, during um, Japanese wartime. Um, I was like really shocked and surprised that even in Japanese and English, there's literally no scholarly work published on it. Um, and the study of the morale of the Japanese military is a very, very emotionally charged issue. And it involves a need to examine all kinds of factors, which are still present in modern warfare today, um, like PTSD and the commission of atrocities by war weary troops. And so um, it's interesting to look at this in a comparative way. Um, but the phenomenon really begs further research in terms of those factors. For me, um, when I was writing my book, I was interested in how did the ads portray the products, who was consuming them, um, and um, how were business and military interests and government interests intersecting at that particular time. And so... Um, I showed you the same postcard. This is a little bit of a larger image of the two girls. You can see it a little bit better. Um, here you can see the older one. She's probably almost around 20. She's about to get married. You can tell by her long sleeved kimono. Um, and this is the imon bukuro or the, the comfort bag. And he, these are the, the caramels that she's putting in. She's a junior high school girl. You can tell by her uniform. Um, and then the canned goods behind. 
Um, they also had tobacco. It's interesting because, like, in the early 1940s, the, the troops are just clamoring for tobacco because people just apparently are not sending enough. And um, lipstick and dolls as well were sent. Um, dolls, I guess, because they reminded the troops of their um, of their their sisters back at, at home or their children. But I think also for pacification efforts of uh, the civilians that they conquered. Um, lipstick, of course, would also be used as gifts for the so-called comfort women, um, the, the women who were forced to work in Japanese military brothels. Uh, some were Japanese, but more likely they were of the conquered populations um, or of the colonized populations like the Koreans and the, and the Chinese. Um, I'm not going to go deep into that topic. It's um, a lot of wonderful news sources and new information that's coming out. Unfortunately, it's still a very uh, unresolved historical issue. Um, and um, But just to kind of let you know that the soldiers did um, take the cosmetics they had in the comfort packages to give to um, civilians that they encountered which they hoped would improve um, their relations with the conquered populations. Um, and so this is again a, an image of the sail that I was, was showing you. This is another sail here by Isetan, which is in Shinjuku. And it shows the different items that are, are being sold. So people could buy a comfort set or they could buy the different clothing items, like for example, a muffler, uh, some socks, um, and a few other winter-like items. And um, just to go deeper into this particular ad, um, it indicates up here, congratulating the Imperial Japanese Army on the victorious Nanking campaign. Um, it also indicates right here that it's an official place to buy items for the Imperial Army. So there's a kind of an endorsement right here. I'm not sure if the military actually said that or if the store is just saying this or, or what, but it's definitely a way to get people in to buy. Um, and just to kind of really reiterate the history. Um, they were developed during the Russo-Japanese War by a women's educator. She was a temperance activist. Perhaps she believed also that candy consumption would curtail liquor consumption. <laughs> um, and the comfort bag also inspired a novel by a journalist who often wrote in the Asahi Shimbun called Nakarai Tosui. Um, back in the day for the Japanese in the early 20th century, Novels were always serialized in newspapers. They did not come out in print until much later. And so that's a phenomenon that's very different from um, kind of the contemporary period. Um, after the Russo-Japanese War, there was kind of a brief lull when comfort bags were still sent domestically in Japan for people who had experienced disaster like harsh winters up in northern Japan or earthquakes, um, such as in 1923. There's a huge earthquake in Tokyo called the Great Kanto Earthquake. Um, but then they really took off right after the Manchurian invasion by the Japanese Kanto Army in northeast China um, in 1931. Um, interestingly enough, the sending of the comfort bags even preceded troop movements. <laughs> so there was some communication between business elites and military elites uh, that, you know, we have to get these things to the battlefield uh, quickly and um, even kind of anticipating the troops. And of course, 1945 ended the, the practices. You kind of wonder, well, how did they get there? How did they get to their destination? Um, so essentially, P, uh, corporations, including news media corporations like the Asahi Shimbun, they would collect them at the offices. Like, so big companies would collect these comfort bags and these, these drives. Um, and then they would make their way um, in trucks to ports. Um, on, they were put then onto military ships going from Japan to ports in Manchuria or Dairen, um, and then later ports in China that had been captured by the Japanese. Um, and then they were sent on rail, truck, and then lastly, mules to their final destination. Um, so you've got corporate businesses that worked with the Japanese Army Ministry and then their supply division. And here's an image of the mass production of comfort bags 
up up here. So you can see the women literally engaged in uh, these massive um, pre preparations of the comfort bags where they're sewing the bags, getting the fabric ready, um, and then the rest of these um, panels in the Asahi Shimbun um, just a few months after the Manchurian incident, which actually didn't end in September 18th. That's just when they began their invasion. Um, you can see the mass production of Japanese flags. They're being finished and sewn. Um, and also, these are um, imperial Japanese uh, seals, they, the chrysanthemum um, symbol of the emperor. Um, so presumably to drape over um, some sort of official area to indicate the presence of the emperor. Um, and these are barrels of, of sake um, and then some smaller items, but just really shows kind of the mass production. And, and here's some more images of the, um, the, the bags themselves. Um, and over here, um, you can also see women involved in creating these little bottles and so on. So these are um, just patriotically um, engaged in Osaka. Uh, Osaka no imonpin no hataraki. So making uh, comfort items in Osaka. Um, distribution went deep into Manchukuo and other parts of the Japanese emperor, empire that served as forward areas for military operations. And so this is a late 1930s postcard from Manchukuo. Um, the Nomonhan incident in 1939 on the border of uh, the Soviet Union um, and north, northern portion of northeast, occupied northeast China um, showed that um, even though the, the so-called hot war with Russia had not yet begun, it would begin with the um, mid-August after Japan, it would begin with, uh-oh, can you hear me? <laughs> okay, um, my connection just wavered for a second. Okay, so here we have, um, this is a, a fake panel, but I believe this is like a railway station or something where um, they made this photograph of the distribution of the care packages. And you can see the soldiers patrolling the border and there's a port city right here. Um, and these were comfort postcards that um, Americans could, sorry, not Americans, what I'm talking about. Um, I'm getting discombobulated from the tech issues. Um, let me see, I'm very sorry. I'm gonna check the tech message here, hopefully chat, okay. Okay, all right. Um, I think we're okay. All right, so um, the the Japanese didn't just depict what was going on in Manchuria or Manchukuo. They also depict what did what they wanted to see going on in areas that they hadn't even conquered yet. <laughs> uh, this is an over-the-top postcard saying that uh, San Francisco de Soba no Yume o Miru, that you'll have the dream of eating buckwheat noodles in San Francisco. Of course, the Japanese never attacked uh, or invaded. Okay, let me see what's going on. Oh, good. We can still hear you. Great. Okay. Um, and so such postcards, this is obviously from 1942 to 1944 when the Japanese were already engaged in battle with the Americans. And so this is um, another one of those morale postcards. And um, here we have one showing soldiers again um, near the um, Soviet border in Manchuria. And again, the Imon Bukuro is located right to the bottom right of the image. Um, and they are in their, their dugout uh, waiting. Um, the postcards also served as propaganda to show both the troops, the people on the home front, and local civilians the passive vacation efforts of the Japanese military. Um, back then, candy was a favorite way of approaching youngsters of a conquered population, um, but apparently also now with um, American efforts and other theaters over overseas. 
Of course, this is what Japanese civilians wanted to see their soldiers doing. Um, unfortunately, the reality was just like what Ishikawa Tatsuzo said in Living Soldiers, unfortunately, children were more likely to be killed than they were um, later to be offered candy. Um, in this case, obviously, the battles had already ended. And um, this, of course, is a constructed image. This is certainly not a photograph um, that shows any form of true reality. Um, but um, they may have um, they may have also uh, developed relationships with the soldiers because they were starving and wanted to receive um, food and other um, other materials to survive. Other postcards show views of important scenes from back home. So this one shows the famous bridge to the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. So this is also an important morale building postcard or the Niju Bashi right here. Um, and um, this here is uh, the Imperial moat. Okay, um, so to kind of conclude my talk today, um, troop care packages were a means to link the battlefield and the home front. Um, the material items in care packages from domestic Japan played an important psychological role for the troops to maintain their battlefield morale. Um, this is what the senders believed, and um, for the troops themselves, they they welcomed these small items from home, where some of the canned goods and the the candies could in fact sustain their um, their energy. Um, interestingly enough, American troops, uh, when they fought Japanese soldiers and later rifled through the packs, um, the mikan or the um, the uh, um, mandarin oranges packed in syrup that was like a welcome war trophy that they ate because they were still in the cans and and could withstand the the heat of the um the pacific island campaigns uh, so interestingly enough the recipients of the troop care package also included the enemy that the japanese were fighting um, including the civilian conquered populations uh, corporations and department stores also benefited from the practice during a time when patriotic consumption became a way to ensure sales and profit. However, between June 1944 and March 1945, when the home front became the battlefield throughout Japan, care packages no longer became necessary. And so there was literally an order um, by the Japanese Navy in January of 1944 saying, please don't send any more true packages. They're not getting to us because of the Allied bombing campaigns on Japanese merchant marine and the military ships as well. So um, the uh, Japanese civilians were in fact urged to contribute money instead of sending these items. And so um, the practice waned when the war became all consuming and um, Japanese civilians began to increasingly suffer um, air raids on their own soil. All right, um, it was really um, a pleasure to share with you some of my past research, and I would be happy to take some of your questions. I have the microphone if anyone would like to ask a question. I see one from Professor Gates. Hey, thank you for this really, uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, I was wondering if you would say a little bit more about, um, I'm here with a composition class, so we've been thinking about rhetoric and persuasion and thinking about whether the um, comfort bag ads and the wartime ads were different, you know, how they were different from other kinds of advertising um, be beyond some of the obvious things you've said. Do they look different as you were opening a newspaper? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, when you see the graphics, right, I mean, there's Kogun, always um, the imperial military, um, and then you might see martial themes. Um, Japanese advertisements, uh, then as well now, as now, they often had celebrities advertising different products that, of course, during the war, 
diminishes somewhat to focus on either um, these stylized cartoon military figures or the guns themselves that they used. Uh, so there's a definite martial flavor to these advertisements that kind of directly connects the viewer to the battlefield. Um, as I was mentioning, Benjamin Uchiyama's book called The Carnival War, he really talks about um, the media presence as sort of inflaming the patriotism of the Japanese greater public from 1937 onwards to really support the war with an intensifying fervor. And there are these increasing tropes that um, begin to appear in the media in, um, in stories uh, like The Aviator, uh, The Actress, um, the munitions worker, um, and a few other important themes and tropes. And so um, in terms of also during the particular Nanking campaign that I, I focused on from November until uh, December of 1937, there are these images of flags, right, populating the landscape, the map of China, um, flags on Chinese towers on the gates of cities and also there's this there's this very clear image that the japanese are modern and that these architectural pieces are very very traditional um they don't really normally depict chinese um unless it's a postcard for example that i showed you where um the battle's already over these areas have been pacified and then you can see the children they don't really show the older people <laughs> Thing, more likely the children are shown um, in the comfort postcards. Are there uh, any questions from the Zoom audience? Would you look and see? Yeah, I don't. I don't see any um, questions on their chat. Well, in the meantime, I'd like to ask. When I'm, I'm curious now about the Japanese military. Uh, the, the length of service, the, the age where people had to be conscripted in, into the military. Could you speak briefly about that? Well, I mean, it also depends on what point in the conflict, right? I mean, at the time of the Manchurian incident in 1931, um, it's basically just the Kanto Army, which is stationed in northeast China and then occupies it, about 10,000 or so troops. Um, the uh, the second Sino-Japanese War, which uh, the Japanese started as well in July of 1937, um, that uh, was considered the they call it Shina Jihen or the China Incident. They didn't think this was going to turn into a full-fledged war. Um, but in the Japanese constitution, there is military conscription for men of a certain age. So they, the draft is required for all uh, Japanese of a certain age. There are certain exceptions, right? I mean, if you're wealthy, you can pay your way out of it. Um, if you're the first son, you can um, pass this to your brother, for example. Um, and so at different Different times in the conflict, different rules applied. Um, by 1938, it was pretty obvious that the Chinese were not going to give up. And the Japanese were able to capture the cities and the railways alongside of the seaboard. But they were never able to carry the inland areas. Very, very hard for them to... Um, China is a massive, massive country. A very diverse geography, very diverse climactic conditions, um, and at the same time, um, you have these kind of two almost ideologically competing um, groups uh, where the Chinese communists are also fighting the Japanese, and they've agreed to unite by 1936, um, and uh, of course, Chiang Kai-shek's um, nationalists, the KMT. So um, to kind of boil this down, um, at the very end of the war, ages 15 to 45 of men were conscripted. Basically, almost all men of that age group had to go to war. Um, and so we're talking about after 1941, things just got worse. And uh, by that time, um, by the 19, late, the mid-1940s, um, 
I mean, you had literally teenage boys going to war, 15 year olds, who in some cases their gun were dwarfed by their guns almost. I mean, you see the pictures and they they're very short. Uh, this also pertains to wartime nutrition was severely con con curtailed from 1940 onwards. Um, and uh, so um, increasingly desperate measures were put into place from 1944 to 1945. Um, if the students and you are interested, there's a wonderful book called Daily Life in Wartime Japan by Samuel Yamashita. He talks about some of the issues surrounding civilians. Um, and Aaron Moore's book, Writing War, talks about the experience of the soldier. Okay, thank you. Uh, check one more time in the Q&A. There may be a question in there. Okay, I see. Let me, um, okay, here we go. All right, so this is by Tyler Roy. When the U.S. went to war with Japan, did all or most wartime propaganda in Japan shift the focus on the U.S., or was the China theater still incredibly prevalent in their propaganda? And were the wartime packages directed more towards one front or another? Okay, so um, obviously the attack on Pearl Harbor, interestingly enough, energized the Japanese media and also to some extent energized the Japanese public because from 1938, late 1938 onward, um, the China conflict really began to bog down. The Japanese military was not making any more headway. They were not having any more brilliant military victories. Um, and it was increasingly difficult for them to maintain control over conquered areas. And so, um, in fact, the Japanese civilians were getting tired of supporting the conflict. Um, also, increasingly... Uh, frugal measures were enacted. They were being put into neighborhood associations where their neighbors kept on checking up on them and, and ratting out them if they uh, were grumbling about the government and so on and so forth. So um, after 1941, there was kind of a, a sense of energy that we were going to win this, this conflict. And interestingly enough, Peter Dewis has these fascinating statistics in his book, Modern Japan, that shows that the Japanese actually, in the very beginning, they actually had more ships than the Americans did. Remember, the Americans are isolationists at the time. Um, they didn't believe they were going to get into World War II, even though President Roosevelt wanted an excuse to, to fight Hitler. Um, and then he later got it because the Japanese were allies of the Germans. Um, but uh, really interestingly, um, the Japanese Navy only calculated they could go for about six months, which was absolutely true because by June of 1942, the Battle of Midway tied, uh, turned the tide of war. Um, and up until then, there was this great euphoria amongst the Japanese public because they were reading and consuming the news of their victorious military in the Pacific theater. Right, so focus shifted from China, which didn't seem to be very successful. It was one of those quagmires that um, it was being viewed as. And then um, in the early 1940s, contrary, 19, late 1941 to early to mid 1932, um, just a lot of energy focused towards the specific conflict, which people genuinely believe that they were winning and that my goodness, you know, they were going to overwhelm this arrogant power, right? How dare the West say, you know, that they that they they would uh, be victorious against uh, the Imperial Japanese. Um, and the Japanese had already suffered this rhetoric from Anglo-Americans about how Manchukuo was not legitimate, 1932 onwards, um, and the Lytton Commission condemning the Japanese for their act of invading Northeast China. Um, Manchukuo was only accepted by 13 different nations, including um, the uh, fascist countries, right, Nazi Germany, Italy, and um, and uh, including, interestingly, the Vatican and El Salvador also recognized Manchukuo, but not the Anglo-American world and not the other European nations. Um, and uh, so there was a, a great uh, sense of euphoria against uh, potentially besting the Anglo-American foes and also liberating the, um, the rest of Asia from Western imperialism. And so this was their rhetoric that they began to to use 
right? Um, and there had already been discussion of the greater East Asia cobra berries here. So um, interestingly enough, I mean, the invasion of um, Asia began even before the attack on Pearl Harbor with uh, the um, the occupation of Indochina on behalf of Vichy France. Vichy France, of course, was was collaborating with um, with the Axis at the time and capitulated to the Germans. So it's really, really complicated, but interesting because like, you have to see this in a transnational and global way. Okay, any more questions? We've got time for one more. There's nothing on uh, oh, Q&A, is see. there? Um, there's one, let me check. Okay, I think it's um, Tyler's question again. Yeah. Um, as for the wartime packages being directed more towards one front or another, um, I think briefly they were being sent more into the Pacific just because people were more focused on that. Um, and obviously more of the um, Navy and other troops were sent into the Pacific areas, so they needed to uh, supply these areas with the, the, the care packages as well. Well, Dr. Colbert, thank you for another excellent presentation. Uh, we appreciate it very much, and we will plan on seeing you a week from tomorrow uh, for your third and final presentation on the otaku culture. So please, let's give uh, Dr. Colbert one final round of applause.